I'm Billy and I'm for everybody that's here in the back of the board. We used to be icebreaker for you guys um, um, is last movie you watched um, that really meant something and why did it mean something? Last movie? That meant something and why did it really mean something? Well, I, you know, I, the last movie I watched, you want me to talk <laughs> to, to the microphone? Uh, golly, the last, the, okay, let me get this right though. The last movie I watched that meant something, right. Um, I, I loved watching The Princess Bride with my grandchildren. <laughs> you know, it's just a great story about how a little guy can become a hero pretty much through the whole thing. So that, that would be it, you know? And maybe old yeller, but that wasn't the last one I watched. <laughs> Uh, so I have a sick child at home. I watched Cars three times yesterday. Nice. <laughs> uh, but seriously, the last movie I watched that really made an impact on me was, uh, it's called My Octopus Teacher, or The Octopus Teacher. It's absolutely fantastic, and it really just opened my heart um, to, to why we're here and, and what good we can do in this world. And uh, sometimes that, that scale uh, is just... It was an octopus, but it was kind of the most human scale, and I felt very human, and I felt my humanity kind of surge in response to that, that creative movie, and, and I just really appreciated what it did to me. Thanks. I was waiting for a rich book, was I reading? <laughs> <laughs> Movies uh, uh, go by me pretty uh, slough off. So, uh, but I can tell you the last movie that I watched was Blazing Bullets. It's a Western, old. Uh, was it really meaningful? No. <laughs> so I'm afraid I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Hi there, my name's Brendan Cronin. And the, uh, the part of the question that I appreciated, and thank you for this, uh, is the part where you said that meant something. Because uh, I watch a lot of romantic comedies with my partners in the back. And, uh, I usually forget them, but they do mean something in the moment. I, I'm a pretty sappy person. I cry real easy. Um, but Forrest Gump, that's the movie that still to me means a lot. Um, maybe it's because my middle name's Forrest. Maybe it's because I was a distance runner. Um, and I wasn't the best. Um, but I always really appreciated the, it's a funny team aspect in distance running, right? You're, you're only as good as the last person to cross the line on your team. Um, and that movie kind of has been a driving force and inspiration for me. Of, like, as long as you're a good person, you keep moving forward. You can probably do something good in the world. Yeah, um, well, thank everyone for being here tonight. Thank the Wigan Woman voters. And again, I just have to give a shout out to our press. We are really fortunate as a community to have great newspapers and great media. Uh, my name is Mark Newcomb. I am running again for county commission uh, hoping that you'll reelect me I, I love the job i love serving you and i, I um, have discovered that it's just a passion of mine to see what we can do with this amazing community um, just briefly i guess with the two kids that we have um, the movie that i can think of was i think it's called shanxi shangxi but uh, it, it is kind of a chinese oriented movie with a lot of mythology and a lot of mystery and uh, it involves forces of nature and I appreciate it because I feel like we have a lot of that here even if we don't have dragons hiding behind the mountains that need to be slain and stuff like that but um, it evoked a lot of fun emotions for me and it was a good just uh, whisk me away for a little bit and, and was very entertaining. All right well uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters and to our uh, media partners, the Teton County Library, for putting this on this evening. And thank you to each of you for being here, uh, spending your night uh, listening to silly questions rather than uh, watching a meaningful movie. <laughs> but uh, my name is Peter Law, I'm running for Teton County Commissioner. Uh, like Wes down here, uh, we've got my wife and I have a three and a half year old. And so we've been through the entire Pixar library. I can recite verbatim most of the Toy Story movies, uh, Cars, The Gambit. And uh, you know, any other movie, uh, you know, I can sit down on the couch and I usually fall asleep, so you have to ask my wife if there's uh, any meaningful ones in there. 
but uh, being able to spend time with family truly is really meaningful. So I would say uh, any of the, Dix the Disney movies right up there for me. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Like, like the others, do you thank you? Thank you guys. Thank the library. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I guess I have a hard sell convincing people that Talladega Nights was <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so I'll, I'll jump to the latest movie we had to watch, which really did have me. But just Tuesday night, I had the opportunity to go to a screening of a film that hasn't been released yet. It's a film um, from um, the North Face um, that features Kit Delarier, the, um, the, the mountaineer, the ski mountaineer that lives out in Teton Village. And it, and it tells the story how she's moved her life from skiing, the first woman to ski the Seven Summits, um, to her latest expedition in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where she combined skiing a high peak Mount Hudley with taking snow samples with wildlife observation that was somewhat systematic to try to understand the impact of climate change on the Arctic Refuge. And so, that film's going to be out in about six weeks, and um, it meant a lot to me to see just that transition in her life. Okay, so send it back down to Wes. And we'll have the, real, the first real question. Okay, um, so this question was submitted by a community member, and then we also received a question from the audience here on this topic, so um, I thought I could combine them. If that says you who submitted this, you can ask it that way too. Um, but it's about uh, assisted living in um, our community. So since the legacy launch closed its doors in the winter of 2021, there is no assisted living and we are losing our elderly slash retired workforce residents who need assisted living. They have to leave their hometown and move away from family and friends. We needed assisted living over a year ago. What are the candidates' plans to bring back assisted living ASAP to our valley? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, whoever submitted it. Um, you know, I can't, I can think of few things more tragic than living for years in this community, building relationships, and then being forced to leave because nature is running its course. That's. That is, that is not the community that, that, that I want to be a part of. Um, you know, we, we got a question about early childhood care at our last forum, and I made the comment that uh, until I had kids, I didn't really understand like, how bad a crisis it was. And so I think the same is true for this. Until we get to that point in our lives, we need to practice a lot of empathy to understand what it is that, that these folks are going through as they as they run into the final chapters of their lives. And we need to do everything we can as a community to support. <laughs> we need to do everything we can to support uh, keeping those seniors here. Um, as in so many problems, this comes down to funding. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to creating a recurring funding source, I would look at our property taxes once again. I am a proponent of spinning some of our general fund uh, tax receipts from the county into things like early childhood care, um, assisted living for our seniors, our mental health and human services community. I just got my property tax bill today, $15,000. $26 is going to early childhood care. So um, I, I really think that we can do a better job of, of funding um, both the beginning stages and the ending stages of life. Uh, thank you. I missed a couple of cues the last time. My name is Tom Sigurdsson. I really want to thank you all for coming and our hosts. Um, going off of what Wes just said, uh, I agree that this is as critical as daycare. And I have a notion of something I would like to explore. Neither one of them seem to be economically viable. They will have to be subsidized. And I was in at the commission meetings when uh, uh, available space was trying to be allocated out between three uh, child care uh, providers. Each one was desperate to have a little more space and it was key to their survival. So I have a notion and it's something that I've stolen from uh, Scandinavian countries. They combine 
their child care and their assisted living uh, facilities together. And I'm curious as to whether that makes a more viable economic model for us to invest in. Thank you. Much like um, the other candidates have mentioned, this is a incredibly challenging topic. Um, I appreciate what Tom has to say about combining early childhood care and the care for our, the elders of our community. Um, you know, this is something I've discussed a lot recently with my partner because neither of our families live here. And we've <coughs> begun to think about that already is where can we buy property elsewhere in order to make it feasible for us to move somewhere else in the future to be able to take care of my family and her family. Um, I think the point that Tom has brought up of combining early childhood care and care for our elders in the same building or facility might be the way to go. As far as the funding stream for that, it's going to take us digging deep and speaking to the people who were here previous to us who are running to represent us in Cheyenne. How can we change this tax structure to be able to bring that funding into this community and keep our, um, the elderly community with us until the end? We lose a lot when we lose family. And we certainly lose a lot, or have lost a lot in the past 10 or 15 years since I've lived here. Um, and I will say openly, I don't have the best answer other than we need to work with the folks in Cheyenne to change the tax structure and bring money into the county. Um, real quick before the next candidate goes, if you guys could just speak more directly into the microphone and a little louder, if there's anybody that's hard of hearing in the room, you know, I was having trouble hearing from here. Um, so imagine out of the back, that's the issue to help. Uh, thank you very much for the reminder. I'm trying to speak loudly. This is an issue close to my heart and it's delicate right now because we do have an application in front of the board to transition the former legacy lodge into housing and i very strongly believe that this community should have assisted living an assisted living facility and i very strongly believe that this community can have an assisted living facility uh, we have um, you know, I, I pride myself on being a thoughtful candidate and a thoughtful commissioner, and, and, and yet when um, there's a, a gentleman here tonight who worked very hard to bring us a SPET initiative to at least learn if we can really figure out how to get an assisted living facility in this community, and I wasn't very rational. You know, he said, hey, what about $20 million? Sure, put $20 million on the ballot. Let's give it a go. Um, it's down to $1.93 million to do the research to dig into the idea and see if it could work in this community. And we still have the question of whether or not we are going to transition, finally, the Legacy Lodge to housing. Again, we have some, some legal findings we need to look at there, and I'll be looking at those carefully and digging into those. Uh, if the Legacy Lodge did not go to housing, I certainly would hope it's ready to go as an assisted living facility. If we don't, if it doesn't go in there, then we might have more opportunities as we move forward with big plans for Northern South Park. If not there, I'm sure that we can find a niche for it elsewhere in the community, possibly using creative ideas like Mr. Seekers from Bada. Thank you. This is a this is a great question. That so often we talk about you know, our policy conversations focus on our workforce, our young people, and too often, I feel like our seniors or elderly uh, just kind of get looked over, and so I'm really glad that this is a question that's asked. Um, first, you know, it comes down to priorities with our budget. Uh, you know, look at how much our budget has increased year over year. You know, we ought to be carving out more specifically to answer this need within our community. Uh, yeah, I look at Legacy Lodge, and it's unfortunate that when uh, you know it shuttered its doors that we as a community or a local government didn't see an opportunity to say, hey, how can we uh, turn this in or keep this going so that we are answering the need within our community. You know, I feel like that ship has sailed and now we do have to look at uh, what are the next options. Uh, Mark mentioned looking at Northern South Park as we plan that. Uh, starting now to raise funds to be able to build a facility that's gonna be able to take care of our, our senior population. 
And part and parcel, when we talk about uh, taking care of our seniors, we have to address the issue of property taxes in that conversation as well. Uh, the increases that we've seen, looking around the room, seeing everyone's hand go up, uh, property taxes raising, rising on average 36% last year. That part falls heaviest on our retirees, people on fixed incomes. I'm sure most of us in the room probably know someone that's deferred retirement and maybe is taking a second job to be able to pay their property taxes just to keep their place here. So when we talk about these issues, we have to tackle those both in the same conversation. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I agree with much of what I've heard. Yes, indeed, assisted living is a core community um, service, especially for any community that's trying to maintain a balanced, um, successful, effective community. Um, rather than repeat some of what I heard, I'm just going to comment on, on the spec measure. I encourage everyone to vote yes on spec item number 13, which is which would provide, as, as Mark said, almost two million dollars to kickstart uh, an assisted living facility. Um, I think that would, is, is critical. Um, I really want to commend a few faces I see here. Kevin Cockrey has led this effort. Bruce Hawkins involved. Lou Hawkheiser is involved. I urge you to speak to all of them, each of them, about this measure. Um, we have an opportunity to actually move the, the ball forward on this. And um, I think we can come up with a model that works. It's going to probably be a public-private partnership or a nonprofit model. This community is incredibly generous. And I think like child care with the Children's Learning Center, we can work out a program that works in this community, even when the market approaches, um, unfortunately, are, are, are not able to work in this community with various factors. It's a real shame that Legacy Lodge did not survive COVID. Um, but as a community, we have an opportunity to go forward and provide um, for an assisted living facility, perhaps at Northern South Park, perhaps somewhere else. Um, and so, yeah, please vote yes on, on spec measure 13. Thanks. Hey, I'll come down and get it. Yeah, it's a long way to pass. Uh, would you, I, I forgot the question. The <laughs> I know it has to do with people my age going into <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what, are, what is your plan to bring back assisted living as soon as possible to the rally? Um, and the other piece is kind of where you see your fit into uh, housing. You know, I, I really look at Northern South Park as a good area probably to work towards having some sort of an enlisted, uh, assisted living place. Um, I went to the senior housing picnic that they have, and they have 75 great units over there by May Park. And then last week, I think we went, I, I lose track of time sometimes. I think we went to, um, oh, I know we went there. I just don't know what day it was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was the... Uh, it was the fundraiser for the senior center. So you get to see these people and you get to see what a good job that they do and these, these apartments that they have are really, are really nice. These people enjoy living there. Well, these people my age enjoy living there. And I think we could do something along that line now as, as some of the developments that we've done, we specifically have designated one-story units for senior assisted living. Uh, the first one I ever did was in Raptor J, right by the senior center, figuring that somebody, uh, or by Legacy Lodge. Yes, I would agree that Legacy Lodge was a tragedy that went down, um, but also it was there for a while before somebody else bought it. So if the community really wanted it, they could have bought it before. Now we're in a crisis again, and I agree with Luther. I think the uh, Proposition 13, the 1.98, even though it won't be funded until probably 2030, is at least a start. Oh, did I forget to say I'm Casey and thank these guys? Damn it, that's okay. <laughs> I'll do it next time. <laughs> Twice, friends. The how long do we have? We have a flood of audience questions, so appreciate that, y'all. You guys got a plug in the legislature, too. How long do we have? We have until eight. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple of audience questions in here about um, spending, um, and you know, a couple of candidates just mentioned SPED. So I want to ask this question: 
You know, there's a lot of items on this year's set ballot, 16, I believe, um, totaling roughly $160 million in sales tax that we collected over seven to eight years, starting in 2024. Um, and I believe it's the largest set ballot in history. Um, and that's coming on two years of some of the largest Teton County general fund budgets, um, roughly $60 million in history. Um, and so my, my question here is, um, should some of these projects be funded in other ways, these set projects we're talking about, um, or are we using SPED appropriately? Thank you for the question. Um, they're probably all uh, appropriate, but Americans love the layaway program. Uh, it seems painless, uh, but the time stretches out, and I uh, am somewhat uncomfortable with the size of the for SPED this time. And uh, the role of the county commissioners to and the town to sort through those, um, I think the attitude has been, well, let the voters decide with the whole uh, smorgasbord before them and they can decide. Um, I think we could use a little more discernment and, um, uh, I don't know, winnowing of the pool of, of applicants. And I know it goes on, as uh, Mark explained, when uh, the senior assisted living came in versus what it wound up to be, of what's realistic. But that's my personal philosophy about it. Um, and yes, it's a, a, a tough situation with rising taxes. Uh, my approach is that taxes are acceptable when there's value that we can recognize and identify and is provided. It's much easier to defend it as an elected official. And that's where I'll be focused. Thank you. Billy, thank you for pointing out earlier that I mumble. Um, <laughs> and I could probably do this without the microphone, but since it's here, we'll just use it. Um, I do struggle when I look at some of the things that came on the spec ballot. Um, I also struggle when I see things that were taken off the spec ballot very quickly. Um, specifically for me, you know, I'm a member of the river community. And I was very upset when I saw the park taken away at South Park. There is now potentially a proposal on the table to move um, some form of employee housing there while they are doing road construction over the next anywhere from three to potentially 10 years. Um, I have concerns about that, that we may never see that change. Um, I think of the things that are on the ballot that are private businesses asking for public dollars to build more housing. Um, when you own a business that is a resource for the community, but you are still essentially a private business, you should work to be funding and keeping your employees in this community versus reaching to the community to which you provide care to and saying, hey, we need more money. I would love to see the money that we're spending on the public-private partnerships focused on the things that truly support this community, like our fire department, like our police department, right? working to build infrastructure to better support them and to house those individuals. Yeah, my understanding of the question is that it's kind of two parts. One is, gosh, we're concerned that the county is spending a lot of money. So yes, we are and we are also taking in a lot of revenue and a lot of that revenue came from the federal government through their programs over the past couple of years ARPA and as well we were successful in a grant application for 25 million dollars to improve our transportation alternatives around getting from town to Wilson to Teton Village so we have a lot going on as far as property taxes go people are really uh, justifiably frustrated our county portion of the property tax is really only 10 or 12% of the amount you pay. So when we uh, experienced increased property tax revenues of about three to $3.5 million over what they were the year before, that allowed us to do two things. One, sink some money into some critical property for our county employee housing. And two, set up a $2 million fund for property tax relief that anyone will be able to tap into next spring so long as you uh, earn less than 75% of your median, of the median county income and have lived here for five years. 
Then we have spec, and as far as spec goes in the limited time I have, the big chunks of spec really are going to the hospital and the Teton County School District, and another big chunk for town and county housing and a chunk for CWC. And I think those are all critical needs of this community, and I'll leave it up to you to choose and sort those out, but it's an expression of how we can be a vibrant community, and I very much support it. Well, thank you. Uh, SPED, I, one thing I really appreciate about these SPED initiatives is it's the ultimate form of democracy, right? We're literally asking whether we want to tax ourselves. And so I hope that each of you will really dig into the 15 initiatives that are on the ballot. Again, we're talking about some $167 million, which you know taxes us to the next 10 years. And there's been talk of an additional seventh penny to you know, make up that. So really, these are your tax dollars that we're talking about. And you know what uh, what gets under my skin a little bit is that so often this spend has become just a wish list of spending of a lot of items that ought to be budgeted into our general budget. Um, you know, you look at sidewalks, uh, school transportation, these are things that we ought to be building into our budget. And especially when we look at you know, increasing our budget by our county budget by 40% year over year, we really have to drill down and ask ourselves if we need to reprioritize where we're spending money. Uh, now that said, I do think there's some really important uh, initiatives that are on that ballot. Uh, water quality being one, the fire stations being another. Again, these are things that we can't afford to put off that aren't going to be budgeted for immediately, so I think we do need to answer. Uh, but again, I think we have to be wise knowing that this isn't just uh, some magical money that comes in the door, but really money out of our, our pockets going to pay for these things. Thank you. Um, good question. Um, I, I like SPEC, um, partly because is, is, as Peter said, it's proved by the voters. Um, we all as voters get to make that decision. I also like the fact that 60 to 65 percent of it is paid by our visitors here. And so we, it's nice of us to offer them an opportunity to help pay for our capital <laughs> needs. Um, and, and so I'm sure that they're grateful for that as well. But seriously, we're still a low tax place to visit. Um, uh, you know, I really do like the fact that the voters get to approve. We also, you know, I think voters like dessert more than vegetables, which is understandable. Um, but, but I was looking back through the, um, the, the spec measures since about the 1980s, and um, I noticed quite an evolution. In the early days, it was very focused on kind of county and city municipal needs, kind of our internal needs. And when I look at the 15 that are on the ballot now, it, it has evolved dramatically to, as, as Mark said, to um, uh, the high school, um, to, um, um, to, um, to, to um, the, the Central Wyoming College and, and the community college there, um, housing for the hospital, projects that aren't going to add to the, to the county's um, annual operating budget. But, but SPED has become something that, that benefits all of the community, and I think that's a real positive um, evolution because the community is not just you know, our government, you know, it's not the administration building at the county, it's, it's all of us. This time I'm going to remember to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Casey Matioski and I'm running for uh, county commissioner. <laughs> Dee, thank you for having us in the first forum. In the press, you know, Billy, I love you. <laughs> You're one of my favorite cub reporters, honestly. Um, <laughs> When he first came into town, he had this big beard that you couldn't even recognize. But now he looks like he could be like on 21 Jump Street, right? I have no vision Anyhow, uh, you know, I'm all for spent tax if it really benefits the community. Uh, the Hoback Fire Station needs redone. Uh, the Wilson Fire Station, where my dad was a fireman for 30 years, needs work. We need it. We need to make sure we have great services in Teton County to take care of us, the people. Um, I like education, even though I didn't do that well in high school. I still think CWC, maybe I could get a, a GED or something out of that. I don't know. And then I also like on the spent tax, clean water. Without clean water in Teton County, uh, this place wouldn't be the wonderful place it is. 
So I think it's become a wish list. Uh, some of the stuff that I'd love to see, uh, most of the stuff on the, on the spec tax isn't shovel ready. It's, we're, we're going to spend $10 million to explore. Well, we should have done that 30 years ago, and then maybe we would have been ahead of a lot of this curve that we're having now. You know, inactivity is what's eating us up. So, um, yeah, thanks again, Dee. <laughs> I guess I failed to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Wes Gardner, <laughs> and I'm running for Teton County Commissioner. And thank you, Dee, League of Women Voters, Library, uh, the Press, and everybody here for being here to inform your votes. Um, spat tax is my favorite tax. It's my favorite tax for a number of reasons. Uh, even before I even understood anything about local politics, I thought it was really cool that I could go to, into a ballot box and try to decipher what it is that I was, I was picking between all these different projects. Um, that's pretty unique here in our democracy, uh, unfortunately. Um, it's my favorite tax also because, like Luther stated, uh, it, there is some magic, Peter, behind the tax. 60% of it is paid by not us. That's fantastic. Uh, our property tax is not that way. So when we complain about our property tax and how unfortunate it is that they've gone through the roof, one, one thing I would suggest, and, and this comes from... Uh, a very old mayor a long, long time ago when he created the spat tax and, and, and pulled it out of his hat in Cheyenne, he convinced the voters of Teton County and the town of Jackson, here's the deal. I'm going to lower your property tax, but we're going to get this tax. We're going to collect it from our visitors. So, so for me, I support all 15 initiatives uh, enthusiastically. You'll see me out there spending my money in support of those initiatives in the newspaper. Um, I... I also understand that a lot of these dollars, we, in order to obtain the federal dollars that we're getting, we have to have local match dollars. This is an excellent way for us to get those local match dollars without taxing ourselves to death.
There'll be a few people that really like this way of answering the question. No, the government should not tell me who I can not vote for on election day. <laughs> 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 oh, no, I didn't, I didn't know if I had to go over and then back. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in term limits. I think term limits are good because what happens in a lot of even these local governments is you become a monopoly. Uh, one party rules all the time. One party ruling is not a good thing. I think in order to have a good commission, you need to have a fair and balanced board. In a board, the four boards I'm on, I don't like to be on a board that goes 5-0 all the time. I'd much rather go 3-2 or go down 1-4 or however it goes, but monopolies I don't think in boards are that good. So yes, I would say new blood every eight years, considering I'd be 75 then probably, <laughs> uh, would be okay with me. Sorry to follow this guy. <laughs> uh, I am against term limits, and I'll kind of use the, the earlier question about Chuck Gray. Uh, I don't agree. I don't think with hardly anything Chuck Gray stands for. But I'm not going to stand in the way of the voters who elected Chuck Gray to do the job that, that we agree the Secretary of State does. So for me, uh, by the same token, I'm not going to stand in the way of the voters and the, uh, the, the voters' franchise just means so much to me that I'm never going to stand in the way of that uh, to tell them who they can or can't vote for. Well, like Casey, this is an easy one to answer because I don't intend to live with them. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Casey thought that was funny. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll get a room in assisted living across the street. <laughs> We can get some assisted living, no term limits. Yeah. Uh, seriously, I would say no. If you don't like the circumstances, vote the bums out. If you're okay, continue to vote. Yes. <laughs> How many years? It depends. We can let them vote on that. Oh, there you go. Okay, uh, this next question is also from the audience. Um, and, you know, looking up the um, panel, I'm seeing some white guys and the white guy asking this question. <laughs> um, and the question here is what segments of our community are do you not see represented by our government in civic spaces? And if elected, what communities will you work to uplift and improve access and representation in government and civic life? And how? Well, thank you. Uh, perfect question. Um, one, I think uh, you look across our community, and we're by and large a very vanilla, old white man community. And even looking up here, we're an old white man group of uh, folks running for, for office. And uh, so, yeah, there's certainly there are a lot of uh, a lot of demographics within our community that are not well represented. First and foremost, I feel, is our Latino community. that makes up something like 30% of our community, yet I feel is very underrepresented, um, oftentimes doesn't have a voice at the table, um, that we just oftentimes kind of overlook. And so I'd love to see uh, more outreach to, uh, to our Latino community in particular. Um, I think there's some really practical things we can do, uh, translation uh, services and public meetings. Uh, making county meetings more accessible, holding them after uh, work hours. You know, for a working family, it's tough to try to take a day off to go sit through a meeting, sit through hours of other items to get to your item. Um, so just practically, how do we make it more accessible for people to be involved in our government processes? Uh, and then obviously too, I think uh, when we talk about uh, fostering diversity across our community, we have to look at the bedrock issues. Um, housing being the biggest. It, you know, I hear oftentimes, you know, we're, we're talking diversity and how do we invite greater participation in our local government, things like that. We ought to start by looking at housing because if we can't afford, people can't afford to live here, uh, you know, for the median house price is four and a half million dollars, of course it's only going to be the ultra wealthy white guys who are living here. So how do we lean into opportunities to get housing in the ground that's really going to benefit those who need it, those who are, are working class? Um, and so to your question, Billy, absolutely. We ought to be doing more to foster uh, greater participation in our local government. But also let's uh, look at some of the macro issues that are making this kind of community we are, the white community. 
Good question. Um, yeah, what is it? Seven guys sitting here. Um, um, I do. I do want to see more diversity: age, gender, um, ethnicity, um, you know, longevity living in this country. Um, uh, it, it is challenging. I, I think Peter's right about certain about you know um, housing and, and kind of creating a structure that's more open. I'm proud that when I was on the county commission, we voted to allow Dreamers or DACA recipients to um, participate in our affordable workforce housing programs. I think that's a big step forward, and it was an undue uh, discrimination. Um, partly, it's just helping people develop their own voice. I'm proud that the county commission um, funds Voices, the organization that helps to provide a voice in government for the Latino community. Um, I think that's very important. Um, as we move forward, I think we have to put more emphasis on developing a pipeline for that very important sector in our community so that people are receiving the mentoring, um, they're engaging in our volunteer boards, we need to make special effort to diversify so people are moving towards developing a higher level of comfort and engagement in government. Um, and that's, that's the, I, I, I'd love to hear better answers, that's the best answer that I have for this really kind of intractable problem. This, this is an easy one for me because um, I think we need more women, uh, honestly, on these boards. I think we're going to need to come forward and I think we're going to need to stand proud. And I, uh, some of the greatest, honestly, living here as long as I have, I have seen county commissioners come and go. One that sticks out of my mind, Sandy Shepprine. I was sitting in a planning commission meeting with nothing going on at 8.45 one night. The door opens up, there's nobody there. Sandy comes in just to check on us. She was our liaison. It thoroughly impressed me. We've had Jolene Coons, you probably don't remember Jolene, the bar balance. And when our boards had a balance, a sensible balance of men and women, things got done. Things got done the right way. And this is the I am the League of Women Voters, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just cry. Um, yeah, I would echo a number of the sentiments uh, that I've heard um, put forward, I, especially like uh, Luther's Pipeline. Uh, you know, I think about, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my privilege as a white male, um, and, and it's only been in the last few years that I've that I've come to recognize that uh, what that privilege means. And frankly, it's not a coincidence that I started to seek public service as that acknowledgement became, I became more aware of, of that privilege. Um, so I try to turn and, and lift others up. And I didn't come from, uh, I, I, I didn't, <laughs> It, my path wasn't the easiest either, so I do understand where that those those assistances can can really prove um, life changing uh, because of my own experience. And so, um, one thing I serve on a couple boards with some younger folks, and uh, there are real challenges to being able to make those board meetings in the middle of the day. Um, We've talked about potentially creating paid positions for some of our board members, and I think that's something that could go a long way to, um, to creating uh, incentives in that pipeline to get more people who uh, may not have the privilege to serve at 11.30 on a Thursday, um, to be able to walk away from a job for a few hours to, to make that happen. So. I think there are solutions to this. We've just got to work together as a community um, with the recognition that, that we really need to help out and use our privilege uh, to help those without it. Thanks, Wes. Uh, I appreciate what you said. Um, I stand convicted as well. I'm speaking from a position of privilege and we'll just couch everything under those terms. Um, in addition to what's been said, um, there needs to be a better pipe, pipeline, as Luther said, for recruitment. And I have a couple of ideas. I'd like to throw it back out to the parties uh, of not just recruiting people who think are electable, 
but also actively recruiting from the underserved populations, women, Latino, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another idea I have is I would like to see the Latino community do an inventory of the skills that they possess. Some of them are professionals, and some of them have worked in farming or ranching or um, health care or any number of other professions in their home country. And I don't think we do a good job of identifying that and promoting it and recruiting that. I'd like to see the county departments uh, uh, look to uh, underserved communities for employees. We are short of employees, and I uh, see nothing wrong with uh, uh, making sure that outreach is adequate to underserved populations, including elderly. Thank you. So the previous question to this was, should there be term limits? And I think that plays very well into this question. If we want to increase the diversity or the ability of people to get into elected office, you need to get other people out of office. That's a pretty simple start for me. The, to uh, Casey's point, it's kind of an easy question, right? We need more women up here. Right? I was very fortunate enough that I have some very, very strong women in my life who encouraged me to do this. I also heard recently that women have to be asked something like seven times before they run for office. Us egotistical males are like, well, I'll do it. I'll give it a shot, because that's where I was. Right? And clearly, we do not have a representative in the Latino community even present in this room at this time. Right? Like, I apologize. Um, clearly, I haven't looked around enough. But for me, like who I wanted to represent and why I wanted to run for office was that true working class. Right? I'm still doing that today. When I moved here, I worked landscaping with a guy who had crawled through a ditch to get into this country. That guy was one of the hardest working individuals I ever worked with. I don't know where he is now. I learned like four words in Spanish and most of them were swears. But I will never forget that story. Right? And those are the people that I want to represent, the true working class in this community. Thank you. Clearly, we have a gender imbalance, and so that is important to understand and to address. I do want to say again, I said it at another forum, that the county commissioners that I looked up to over the course of my life here, the ones that were most courageous, that exemplified true leaders, and who were the most thoughtful, were typically the women who were on the county commission. They set the standard for pushing us into a, a the, the modern era when we really needed to have planning and zoning. They looked out for our water quality way back before it was a popular political issue. And they always brought critical, thoughtful abilities to the commission. So I know that in this community we're capable of electing women to this board. And what I've done personally is try to put women onto the planning commission, my bias having started on the planning commission to then go to the board of county commissioners is to try and ensure that we have a, a planning commission that has women on it. And if they choose, then they can step up and run. It turns out one has, she's running for town council, not county commission. Um, and that's what I would continue to strive to do. As far as the immigrant population goes, we really need to try and ensure that uh, they also have a pipeline. And one of the ways I think we can do this is at least looking at the second generation of immigrants and saying, you can definitely have housing here so that you have stability. And once you have that stability and you are in the fabric of the community, you can start thinking carefully about politics and running for county commission. And hopefully we will have more diversity as we go around a few more elections. Turn to go first. Do we have another question? Yeah. Um, so, Northern South Park has been the biggest asset in the past few decades. Would you support more zoning for density in the county beyond Northern South Park? Where should the next us zone be? And um, from the crowd, we had how do you think conservation should influence our county's What was this, how, how conservation influences housing? Yeah, yeah. conservation and housing. Um, 
Gotcha. Um, good question, but I want to just clarify. There has not been an upzone in Northern South Park for the for the workforce housing project that uh, program that's been discussed over the last couple of years. I hate to get into too much planning minutia, but the the, um, the county commission approved a um, unanimously approved a new neighborhood plan for portions of. I'm talking to you. Even though there's other people in the room. Um, Approved a, approved a neighborhood plan for a portion of Northern South Park for about 225 acres. And I just want to point out there, there's a lot of work yet to be done before turning dirt in that new area that's approved for housing. Um, I want to take a moment and describe my perception of that project. Um, it went from what was originally proposal when I was first on the commission, early on the commission, to rezone 74 acres with, depending on who you believe either zero percent de-restricted workforce housing or as much as maybe 10 percent. Um, we said no to that, which I think was the right call, and instead we approved a year and a half or two years later a plan that is somewhere between 70 and maybe as much as 85 or 90 percent de-restricted workforce and affordable housing. And so right now I can't think beyond that section of Northern South Park to what's next because there's so much work to be done in terms of bringing workforce and affordable housing, de-restricted workforce and affordable housing that will be and will remain available for workers in the community before we think about anything else. Thanks, Webb. Yeah. Okay, the question was where, where should growth happen? Right, and then the next part was conservation. So they probably go hand in hand with this, and there's no funny answer to this. But you know, I'm looking in my neighborhood on the planning commission. We just allowed, uh, or just voted for. I don't know what the commissioners have done, but 23 units right next to my property for workforce housing for the highway department. And the reason I did that is, even though that will double the population in my neck of the woods. We have infrastructure there. We have water, we have sewer, we have roads, we have a school, we have a grocery store that's a couple miles down the road, Hobat. Um, so I look at the Robertson property as, a, as an obvious place to grow. Uh, Larry Ewan wanted to try to get something done down there. He just asked if they could do it. We got shut down. I voted, I went down four to one on the planning commission. I don't know what the county commissioners did, but we were waiting around for a plan to happen. That was two or three years ago. Guess what? Two or three years ago, we could have used housing. We don't have it. We plan ourselves into oblivion. Uh, I've seen this happen for 30 years. We've had the shots to take care of what we need, but we always say no because I don't know if we're afraid or if the fact of the matter is we're happy with the workforce living in Alpine or living over the hill in Victor. So I think it's time to start saying yes to some of these, and unless people try to start. I, I was in a meeting with Luther, and <laughs> I think I talked to him about it. I said, you, you, don't, you know well, Luther, that uh, if you said yes, Teton County could bankrupt the first developer. Hell, we've done it three or four times. So we do a good job of getting what we want as Teton County, but we haven't even been trying lately. So I would say, first of all, that Northern South Park is the, it's a generational opportunity. So thinking beyond Northern South Park is so like, what's the next opportunity in the county? I couldn't agree more with Luther. Let's get this right. And if, if we don't get it right, there's significant consequence because we're talking about 1,800 units potentially. We're talking about 40%, maybe 50% of those being designated affordable. That means they're tied to income. That to me is what matters. That's the biggest, most important percentage that matters to me. Um, workforce designations are nice, but you're not really shaving much off the private market when you just when you just stipulate that this is this is restricted to people who work in Teton County. Um, I would echo Casey sentiment on uh, Larry Hughes project at Munger. If I I was in the room when the commission made the decision, and I was. Uh, I would have voted differently, um, and I would have voted to move that forward and put the ball back in Larry's court. 
um, to the point where we could then talk about uh, we would have, we would have been in a better state to discuss Northern South Park because we would have been through the process already at Munger. And I'm not saying we would have gotten housing out of it. I might have said no to that. I'm not afraid to say no to housing that doesn't include significant, affordable, income-tied workforce housing in it. Um, Luther has invoked his red card, so if you could send that Sir? down. I thought I'd reply since I was, I was brought up, um, what my name was. Um, I just want to emphasize something that I think distinguishes some of, the, some of us. Um, I've, I've, I've followed the housing market here for quite some time. And in today's market, given the fact that we have such a limited land base, if we approve housing that is not deed restricted, permanently deed restricted for affordability, or perhaps for the workforce, we're going to get more luxury housing, and we're going to get more remote workers, and more wealthy retirees, and more people whose family office tells them they need to have a house here. That digs the hole deeper. So yes, I have voted no on projects that are going to dig the hole deeper. Like the first time that Northern South Park came in. Zero to 10% deed restrictions, digging the hole deeper, because we all know those would have been $3 million homes in today's market. I vote yes for projects such as the one on Horse Creek that's, deep, that's going to be deed restricted for social service workers and law enforcement, such as, uh, I didn't vote on the zoning, but I voted to move the project forward because the county is a partner of the Jackson Street Apartments. And so I really want to emphasize that in my opinion, we need to say yes to development that's going to provide more housing for our workforce more housing for our critical service providers, affordable housing, and, and not just critical service providers, but those people that just provide for this community. And we don't need to say yes to development that's going to make our housing situation worse by creating more, more jobs. Let me clarify that if I can, Mr. Luther. Because, <laughs> because actually, I think when you say no, you don't get private development a chance to try. Plain and simple. You don't know what you could have got out of the Robertson property. You don't know what you could have got out of the Gill property. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, I think the Gills had, had Teton County in their heart. I really do. For somebody who's been here as long as I had and growing up with them, I was insulted that they were attacked. And the Robertsons have been trying to do something with their property for 30 years, and we've said no. So. It's time we start saying yes and then getting what we want instead of just saying no and waiting three years for something to happen. Thanks, fellas. <laughs> um, I stand pretty much where Wes does. If there was a lost opportunity in people who bring uh, uh, proposals forward, then that would perhaps be a mistake. Uh, but I do believe in the same bright lines that Luther has expressed, is that we cannot continue to just feed the monster. We must draw the bright lines and specify what works for our community and what does not. And that, to some degree, falls uh, to the county to make those calls. And, you know, it's okay to be wrong, but you can't be wrong too long, and perhaps we're at that threshold. Um, so, that's my feelings on it. Thank you. I mean, to really answer this question, I need like 15 red cards. <laughs> so if I could pool them, but that, that's possible. <laughs> so, as a member of the workforce here, I can't really afford to buy it. Um, but for me, you know, this does kind of hit home. Um, I moved here, oh God. I lived in my car four times to pay off my student loans. Um, you know, I have lived in an apartment that was managed by the Housing Trust. The only reason I was able to live in that apartment is because my partner is a member of the Search and Rescue. That unit was reserved for Search and Rescue. While living there together in a one bedroom, we were able to save enough money. We recently were able to purchase a workforce unit. The thing that stands out to me, though, in all of this is 
the density aspect of it. Yes, like I grew up near a city. I think we should increase density in spots, but let's be realistic. My neighbor is a fishing guy, right? Where's he gonna park his boat? That's how he makes money, right? We have to start thinking a little more about the workforce housing that we're building, right? Shouldn't everybody get a covered spot to put their boat in? Shouldn't everybody do what you do in New York City, where sometimes when you rent an apartment, you get a little locker room downstairs, right? And not everybody has a boat, but we have to be realistic about the housing that we're building for people if we want to actually keep them in this community. Not everybody can live in a dorm room. And then to talk quickly about um, the conservation aspect of it, I have concerns when I continue to see a valley that has 97% of the land protected already, and we keep adding to that. You're only increasing the value of land and ruin, not ruining, but decreasing the chance for people to be able to afford homes. Oh, Mark. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Red card can go before that. I go first. The red card goes first. Oh, red card goes There we go. Yeah, the conservation aspect, uh, there is one thing, that, uh, another step that the county can take that we have not yet, and that is we have not updated the natural resource land development regulations. We've put our heart and soul into zoning at this point. It's a blunt tool and uh, our, more conservation can be achieved even when we say yes, go ahead and develop, if we would uh, update those and bring them into the 21st century. Yeah, this is the key issue for this community. So first of all, I have said yes to over to policies and to specific projects that have resulted in over 400 units of housing. Those houses are and units are being developed in town, close to services. And I have said yes to the housing down at Horse Creek. And I have said yes to housing for lower valley workers. And the wide eye has not come in front of us yet, but I have a good feeling about it. I have a good feeling about all of those because they guarantee housing for our workers. A, a lot on the free market now, and we can put a thousand of those lots south of town. And those lots are gonna sell at least for a million bucks each, small town size lots. And then once you build a house on them, it's going to be two million, three million dollars. That is not what these workers up here on this panel can afford. It's not what the community can afford. So we said no, I said no as well, to a really heartfelt proposal by Larry Hume. And no one should get attacked in this community for bringing that kind of proposal to this to the table, but I said no. And when I said no, I knew that that land, which it is now, would be available through our zoning for folks who want to start a business, who want to buy a piece of property, who want to have a shop, who want to have a contracting business, express their entrepreneurialism in that part of the county. Red card, please. Um, I also said no to, again, a really meaningful, heartfelt proposal by the Gill family, again, for nothing but single family housing on their land, up to 300, 312 units. I said no. Now what's happening, potentially, in Northern South Park? Up to 1,300, over 1,300 units of guaranteed workforce housing, deep restricted, 1,300 units. They are also going to be allowed to, to put some units on the free market because those, mark, those units are so valuable that it allows them to do really generous things like offer up 45 acres of free land, free land that we can build the deep restricted housing on. So again, no one should get attacked for bringing those good ideas to the table, but trying to unleash the free market, which is the thing that we like to hear out like the saying here, just won't bring home the whiskey. We've got to be disciplined about our approach to housing. We've got to be thoughtful. We have to be courageous. We do have to let these really good-hearted people bring their proposals to the table. We do have to partner with them. And we are going to push the limits in Northern South Park, push the limits of the community's patience, worry that we're unleashing nothing but free market housing that will just attract all these new tech entrepreneurs who make way more than the workers here. 
and pushing the limits of philanthropy and pushing the limits of creativity in having how and how we deliver those affordable houses. Well, that'd be a hot topic. Uh, wasn't sure if you get the mic or not. <laughs> any more uh, any more red cards down there? Good. Uh, well, no. Uh, let me start by saying Northern South Park is a big win for our community. And you know, two years ago, I was the only candidate who was supporting it, and I, uh, I still very much support it. and want to see that we get the, the zoning and get it across the, the finish line. But Northern South Park really demonstrates what we can get done as a community when we get all of the stakeholders, our local government, landowners, builders, nonprofits, in a room to collaborate, and when. Shelter JH and a landowner can both say, hey, this is a good opportunity. We've done something right. And uh, to that point, I think uh, the flip side is that too often, we've heard it talked about up here, uh, we, we, let, we become so beholden to the comp plan that we out of hand say no to really good opportunities instead of starting from a position of, how can we get this done? How can we make it work for our community? And out of that, we risk poisoning the well, right? That landowners aren't going to keep coming to the table. And that their alternative right is to parcel up that land into 35 acres and uh, sell it for a load of money. And we've got uh, just a worse problem on our hands and less resources than to work with. So I'm very much of the mind that we ought to be working with everyone across our community, particularly the stakeholders, to figure out how we can get some of these big chunk projects done. Uh, government provided housing is great. It's great when we can get things done with 100% afford uh, deed restrictions and affordability. I'll go ahead and use my red card while we're at it. Um, but the real reality is to truly answer the housing needs in our community, to make sure that we uh, house our workforce here in Teton County, it's going to take more than just piecemeal projects that are funded by taxpayers. We're going to have to work with landowners. We're going to have to work with private developers. And this Northern South Park is a great example of how we can get that done using incentives to build in more density, or density bonuses for building affordability, uh, again, working with nonprofits. There's a handful of examples, of course, Street being another, that we've got the pieces here in our community. We've got the resources. We ought to be bringing them to the table versus solely going in alone as a uh, county being the builder of housing. Well, oh, another red card. <laughs> okay. Down the west. I issue my red card with uh, some trepidation because I'm going to bring up a topic um, when it comes to Northern South Park that I think. Um, if I'm elected as a county commissioner, I take my responsibility very seriously on the behalf of this community who needs affordable workforce housing so badly. So some of the things that we really need to make sure that we get right and that we have dialed before we give up any leverage when it comes to Northern South Park are first of all exactly what do these affordability assurances look like? What percentages of the AMI are we talking about? And I understand this all happens in the zoning process. However, I've seen too many times our local elected officials give up the moment of leverage before we've worked out the details that are so critical to making sure we're getting the actual projects that we're promising the community that we're delivering. Secondly, I need to understand the nature of the 45 acre donation. Um, I need to make sure that the community has flexibility to develop those 45 acres based on their own needs and based on their own timing. And the easiest way to get this done is to have the donation go directly to the county. I see a lot of people kind of scratching their heads, why are you talking about this? It's because I'm committed to making sure that we are getting for the community what we're promising we're getting them out of this deal. We are now at the summary portion of the evening, and we're going to start with Casey, and you each have a minute. Okay. Hey, I'm Casey Matty and I'm running for county commissioner. <laughs> Let me get that out of the way before I forget it. Um, 
why would you vote for me out of all these other people? Well, in around 1995, I was sitting in my easy chair at home and I was complaining to my wife about all these people that were on the planning commission. And she, you have to know my wife, but she just told me to shut up and go do something about it, you know? So I did, I got on the planning commission in 96. Um, I served till 2002, and then I got back on it around 2020. I've been a 13-year member of the Wheaton Pest Board. I sit on uh, the Board of Examiners for the Town of Jackson. So my first board I got appointed to, Mr. Guru put me on that board, sitting in the back. Mr. Fitz appointed me to some boards sitting in the back. Uh, Sandy, Sandy Shuttrine put me on boards. Art has put me on boards. Jess has put me on boards, am I missing? And Mr. Vogelheim has put me on boards too. So these people that are, are, that are, um, are elected officials trust my opinion, and I work hard at it. I go to every meeting. I'll go to, I'm sorry, I gotta stop, but and I use my red card. But again, I'm Jason Patinovsky, I ask you to vote for me. Uh, again, I'm Wes Gardner, running for Teton County Commissioner. I hope to win your vote. Um, I, from the first time I came to Jackson Hole, I was an 11-year-old. I knew this is where I wanted to be. Um, over the 25 years I've lived here, I've uh, met my wife playing frisbee at the Center for the Arts field. We got married uh, at Peter's Ranch uh, with a beautiful backdrop of horses and Mount Moran in the background. And now we're raising our two kids here in Game Creek. And I've seen a lot of changes over 25 years. And when I was just here a couple years, I remember you know, a lot of changes. Everybody says that. And it, it, Jackson is a changing environment. But over the last two years, that change has accelerated to the point where we're, our community is spinning out of control. We are, there are fewer and fewer people who are going to be able to stand here 20 years from now and tell the story that I can tell. And to me, that is a really dangerous fulcrum point for our community. So when you hear me up here talking about these issues, I hope you'll take the time to dig in, votewestgardner.com. I go deep into all these issues. I'm a student, and I'm a creative person, and I, I, I promise you there's ways out of our problems. we just got to be more creative and more thoughtful. And I'm Tom Sigerstrom. I'm running for county commissioner. I saw the others. And, um, I'm a moderate Republican. I came and moved my company here in 87, built it up, was able to sell that company, but I uh, pioneered an entire industry that exists here, the wildlife uh, viewing industry. I've been elected by all of you before, twice, onto the Conservation District Board, and I've served on appointed boards as well, uh, several, library board, concert, uh, natural resource, Technical Advisory Board, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of those I've chaired. I've worked with landowners in expressing and exercising their land ownership rights through the Jackson Hole Land Trust. And I'm anxious to get your vote, but I encourage you to visit my website, my card, and uh, uh, contact information, including my phone number, 413-2704. Feel free to call me. I'm anxious to hear your ideas and your thoughts. Thank you. So I sat here and I, I thought, you know, why are you guys going to vote for me and gals? Again, my name is Brendan Cronin, I'm running for county commissioner, like all the other guys up here. Um, I bring a different perspective. Okay, I ran as an independent because I didn't want to be associated with either side. I really didn't. And I find it ironic that I am sitting right in the middle of the table. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> the other ones, I was always on the end. I was like, oh, they're into something. Um, you know, and, and I feel like that independent mindset represents this valley really well. Right? I didn't grow up here. I drove a 91 Toyota Camry that didn't go over 60 miles an hour. Um, and, I, and I came to this place to ski, like a lot of people. But what has kept me here is the other things around that. And the biggest part of that is this community. Um, I'm still in the workforce, right? 
I just turned 40 years old. I know my hair makes me look like I'm 70, <laughs> but I just turned 40 years old and I just bought a house for the first time three months ago. I'm gonna use this, okay. And I held on to that because this is the reason that I wanna to talk to everybody here, is that I bring a slightly different perspective. I'm still here, I'm still fighting, and I still see other people trying. Okay, and I want to be the voice for that community. I recognize fully though, that we need the diversity in this community and not just um, racially or male and female, but the economic diversity because we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't admit that the money and the tourism is what, is what keeps people here and allows some of us to live here. Am I the biggest fan of it? No, but I want to bring that idea and that perspective that, hey, I'm still here and I'm still fighting and I'm still working and I want to work for you. So when you vote for me in November, it's Brendan Cronin. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight. I'm Mark Newcomb. I am running for re-election, and I, I really appreciate everyone coming here tonight. Um, when I was first elected, I, I really thought, boy, I pulled one over on this community. A, a former ski bum and climbing bum got elected, and I tried to piece how, how that happened. And I realized that as a guy, the one thing I really wanted to do was to make sure that my clients were the best they could be, that they climbed the best things that they could climb and, of their ability. And that's really where, that, that's where my passion comes from for running. It's what I want this community to be, and I have a knack for trying to bring that out of folks. It's been a true honor to serve this community, it really has. And I am so grateful that I've had this opportunity. And I hope to continue doing my best and one of the things I've really enjoyed doing the most is just listening to people. And I've been told that I've been right, and I've been told that I've been absolutely wrong. So if folks come and they say, boy, you really should have approved Mr. Hume's uh, subdivision proposal, I'm willing to sit down and listen to that and have a really good conversation about it. And it doesn't matter what topic you bring to the table. I'm here to listen to you and to try and understand how I can weave that, in, that idea into making this community the very best community it can be. Well, thank you to all of you here tonight and to everybody who's watching online. Um, my name is Peter Long. I'm running for Teton County Commissioner. And you've heard from all of us up here what we're going to do or what we'll fight for if elected. And I can promise you this, you're going to hear a lot more promises in the next six weeks. I want to tell you why I'm running. And very simply, that's to be a voice for you be the voice for the people working hardest to keep our place here in Teton County, our working class, the people who are living paycheck to paycheck, the people who are struggling figuring out how they're going to pay their mortgage, how they're going to pay their rent. Uh, and not only that, in the here and now, but also making sure that Teton County remains a place that our kids and future generations can call home. And so we're certainly at a tipping point right now. Uh, you know, and so much of it just boils down to common sense. That we can't say we're for workforce housing and continually vote against it. We can't say that we're for our seniors and ignore property taxes. That we can't say that we're for our working families and ignore the rising health care costs and child care costs. And these are, these are issues that I understand and my wife and I grapple with them all the time, figuring out how we're going to keep our place here. And so we go to vote very simply and ask for two things. One, that you go to our website, Long for Teton County, contact me, we'd love to talk with you more. And then when you do go to vote, please vote long for Teton County Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Crush. I hope you'll vote for me uh, between now and November. Um, I'm a recovery lawyer, recovery land use planner, spent 35 years as a community advocate. Uh, I'm, I'm an incumbent, look forward to serving another term if I have the opportunity to do so. You can look at my record. I have a record of supporting community, a record of supporting conservation, and a record of, um, of supporting housing that truly is going to benefit our workforce. That's why I'm proud that Shelter JH has endorsed me, and I'm willing to say yes sometimes. I'm willing to say no sometimes, but in every case, I'm going to make sure that to the best of my ability, we are seeing development that benefits the workers in this community rather than more development that's going to be luxury housing 
that only digs our hole deeper. And yes, we, we have experimented. Remember when Hidden Hollow was presented as naturally affordable because of the density. And now I see a townhouse there listed at $6 million. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not helping our workers. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you.